Hello, everyone. Welcome to this um, View on Africa briefing on the African Union Commission elections um, that are to take place in January next year. So, um, as most of you know, we had elections um, on the 18th of July uh, in uh, Kigali in Rwanda, and there were three candidates, um, no winner. Uh, I will speak a little bit more in detail about those elections, what we can learn from them going forward. Um, a new deadline was then set for the AU Commission chairperson um, and the deputy chair of the 30th of September. And um, so the experts, the panel of experts and the ministerial committee met on the 7th of October. So, um, and then this week, um, the legal counsel of the IAU is sending out an, an, what they call a not verbal to all the embassies. Um, at yesterday late, it hasn't gone through yet. So they, we're still waiting for the official announcement, but we think we know who are the um, five candidates um, for this uh, election in January. Um, it's it's uh, It's been out there now for a while and all the different countries have announced their candidates. But I think to start off with, uh, it's very important to um, have a historical perspective because um, one could perhaps be under the impression that um, We've been going through this uh, many times and that everybody knows what they're doing, but actually the AU is a very young organization. Um, in, it, it, in 2002, we had Amara Essi, the former foreign minister of Cote d'Ivoire, who was um, um, handing the transition from uh, the OAU to the AU. He was then interim chairperson of the AU Commission. And um, at those elections in 2003, which were in Mozambique, uh, in Maputo, um, there was really consensus that Alpha Omar Connery, the former president of Mali, would become uh, the new AU uh, chairperson. There weren't really any suspense, no um, media around it. Uh, we didn't know who the other candidates were, actually. It was well known that uh, former South African um, President Thabo Mbeki supported Alpha Omar Connery because the idea was that the AU would have a stronger leadership than uh, the OAU and that the, the um, profile of the AU chair commission uh, chairperson should be um, uh, like a former head of state. Um, but as many of you know, there were many problems with Alpha Omar Connor in the sense that some heads of state felt um, they're not going to take any lessons from him. He is a former head of state. So they then opted for the other option to have a former um, foreign minister again from Gabon, who really also didn't have that international profile. Um, and so actually the, the first time there were these high profile uh, elections where we knew he has two candidates um, facing off was in uh, January 2012 when Jean Ping faced off in Kosozana at Lamini Zuma. Um, it was a very tight race. There were many rounds of voting, and in the end, uh, Jean Ping won, but he didn't get a two thirds majority. So then those elections were postponed until July uh, 2012, um, which was the first time this had happened. And actually, between January and July 2012 is the first time we really saw campaigning. Uh, South Africa went out, um, went to the various uh, countries. There was a very strong campaign from South Africa to get Nkosazana Lamini Zuma elected because um, South Africa almost, uh, because of its status as a superpower and a strong um, um, country, a heavyweight on the continent, almost um, took it for granted that Nkosazana Lamini Zuma would win in January 2012, and it wasn't the case. Jean Ping. Um, didn't have such strong support. He comes from a weaker region, uh, Central Africa, and um, he didn't have that strong backing from his president as well, um, uh, President Ali Bongo, as we know now, uh, Jean Ping, they've now become strong mm -hmm. enemies. Um, so Nkosa Zanad Lamini Zuma then won. Um, so 
when the elections, she actually took uh, over her position only in October 2012. So when the elections happened this year in July, it was almost the first time we had um, a, a range of candidates, we had their countries backing them, we had campaigns, and also for the media and analysts, it was the first time that there was this um, almost public campaigning around this issue. And um, we, uh, the uh, ISS Peace and Security Council report published six questions to the candidates and they had to produce their uh, campaign statements. Um, but it's a learning curve for the AU and I think for all of us who are um, observing and writing about this. Um, because now, the these elections uh, there's really a lot of suspense the countries are going out they're facing off one another in in the election it's a little bit like the un secretary general elections where it was all quite hush hush uh, between the permanent five members of the un but now um, in these latest elections uh, to replace ban ki-moon we saw uh, a month or so ago public campaigning interviews so uh, it is a learning curve um, for everybody. Um, okay, let me just go back. Um, of course, the very important considerations in the elections are the CVs, the past experience of the candidates, uh, that goes without saying, regional representation because of the nature of the AU. Different to the UN, we've got 54 countries, um, there is no a small uh, permanent five who can push through decisions. Um, the support of the, the countries and the presidents are very important. The Anglophone, Francophone balance, I'll go into all this in more details. And then one must just keep in mind that um, there are eight uh, commissioners for the AU Commission as well that have to be elected after the AU chairperson um, gets elected. So um, we have in previous meetings, uh, briefings spoke, uh, you know, um, we've spoken about these, the other candidates and, and there are some articles as well on the on the website of the PSC report around this. But now, but um, presumably it, it will be the same candidates more or less for these um, eight commissioners and then the deputy uh, chairperson. But <laughs> Um, the reason why it does come to play in the, these elections that we are talking about now is because of the regional and um, gender balance. Because there is um, an unwritten rule that at least half of the eight commissioners should be women um, and that there should be a fair regional representation. Um, it would be rare for the chair and the deputy chair to be from the same region, for example. Um, so these are, it makes it all uh, extremely complicated. Um, so as I said, in so in July we had three candidates. We had Dr. Spisioza uh, uh, Gazibwe from Uganda, who we thought was actually the one with the strongest profile at that point. She's a former deputy president of Uganda. She fell out immediately. Um, the candidate from Equatorial Guinea, Akapitum Bamukoi, fell out in the second round. And then um, Pelonomi Benson Moitoi, the foreign minister of Botswana, um, in the final round, she got uh, 23 votes with 28 abstentions. And the way we analyzed it at the time was that it was almost a boycott um, by West Africa and, and a, couple, a couple of other states who right from the start felt that these three candidates don't have the profile and the CV of um, a head of, st uh, of a chairperson of the AU Commission. Um, there were many calls before the July vote for it to be um, uh, postponed uh, um, so that more countries have a chance to put forward candidates. One almost got the impression in July that some countries were caught unawares and that they hadn't prepared and that they missed the deadline because the candidates had to be in three months ahead of those elections. So. Um, Eko was formally in on the 17th of July uh, in Kigali asked for um, a postponement uh, of the election so that they could put, put forward their candidate um, uh, Abdullah Batili from Senegal. But that was shot down. Uh, the chairperson, it is to be from Chad and the host. Um, 
Paul Kagame from Rwanda wanted these elections to go ahead. And so they did. And so there wasn't a two thirds majority. And that's why we've got this postponement now. Um, as I said, um, so there were this, uh, these are the closing dates, the note verbal, which will go out this week. So the candidates. We have uh, two former candidates. Who, uh, so Dr. Pelanomi Vincent Moitoy from Botswana. Um, she is um, the foreign minister. She has been foreign minister since 2014. She's held a number of cabinet positions in Botswana. Um, she did again get the endorsement from Sadek, if we understand correctly. Um, but I must add that um, these, um, it isn't as if formally states are now bound to vote for her um, because the vote is secret. Um, and the five regions of the AU doesn't really correspond with the uh, regional economic communities. For example, we saw last week um, reports from the Kenyan media, who've been very strong campaigning for their candidate, Amina Mohamed, the foreign minister. <coughs> The, the reports came that in Madagascar, Comesa has officially endorsed her, the Kenyan candidate. But um, as many of you know, uh, Comesa, the, co the Commission for Eco common, market. common Market for East and Central African States, that's right, um, overlaps with SADC. So there are countries like Tanzania and so on that, you know, will have to decide which region they, they vote for. So this endorsement is important. It's part of the campaign, but it's not as if states are completely obliged to then vote for her. So she has an honorary doctorate. She's not someone with a very high international profile. Um, and I'll go in later um, when we look at the strengths and the weaknesses of uh, the different um, uh, candidates, um, Botswana uh, doesn't have a strong profile within the AU. Um, Botswana's president, Ian Kama, has not really gone out and uh, supported her. Um, so, and the very contentious issue of the International Criminal Court that I'll touch on later will also either be in her favor or against her. Um, Mr. Mba Mokui from Equatorial Guinea is running again. Um, he came second. Um, so he's the Minister of Foreign Affairs, a very close uh, special envoy of President um, Theodore Obiang Ngema. Um, and I must say, um, if you look at the interviews that we did, uh, the PSC report with the various candidates, he, he really, um, of the three candidates, we felt had a very strong um, vision for the AU um, uh, and a more international approach to the AU. So um, perhaps uh, President Obiang feels that um, they still have a chance, they can still campaign. After all, as I said in 2012, Lamini Zuma didn't get a two-thirds majority and then she won in July. So um, things can change in the six months. But I think for some heads of state, it's also almost an issue of pride and, um, you know, it puts their country forward, etc. cetera. Um, uh, Abdullah Batli uh, of Senegal was one of the strongest candidates. Um, he, he has been campaigning for a while because he was um, candidate uh, for Senegal, but they missed the deadline, as I said, in July. And we saw, uh, for example, the um, French media, um, magazines like Jeune Afrique published an interview of Abdullah Batili in July while the other elections were going on. So there's been a behind the scenes campaign even before uh, July, our, our last uh, election. Now, who is Abdullah Batili? He is a special representative of the UN Sec uh, um, Secretary General for Central Africa. It's a very important position because he's had to um, uh, handle the crisis in the Central African Republic and now very recently, end of August, September, the crisis, the post-election crisis in um, Gabon. Um, he was also involved in mediation in Mali um, when the crisis broke out in 2013 as Deputy UN uh, Representative there. Um, he's a former minister 
of environment under Abdullah Wad. He was a supporter of Abdullah Wad in uh, 2000 um, during those elections. Then he switched allegiances and uh, supported Maki Sal. Um, he was then a minister as well. He, he has been candidate for president in Senegal uh, a number of times, but he didn't make it. Um, He's very well known as a pan-Africanist, um, a leftist campaigner, I would say, um, on the continent. He's got a good network because of his UN links, but also um, uh, in those days when um, there were totalitarian <coughs> regimes or, let's say, um, uh, one party regimes in places like Senegal and elsewhere and he was campaigning um, at the time um, but he's also um, uh, personally uh, seen by the Senegalese I spoke to many people uh, of these various countries of course uh, what the um, um, profile is of these candidates Abdullah Batali is quite uh, stern he is not um, very charismatic um, uh, person. I mean, that was one of the accusations against Nkosa Zanat Lamini Zuma as well, that she wasn't very charismatic. So, but this is this is Abdullah Patli, who uh, we've known these last couple of years. Then uh, Kenya came with uh, its foreign minister, Amina Mohammed. Um, she is. Uh, She's charismatic and feisty and um, quite determined. Uh, I think uh, Kenyans know her and other people on the continent. Um, she is the cabinet secretary for foreign affairs. Uh, so she's minister of foreign affairs for Kenya. Um, she worked as well in international organizations, the international organizations for, for migration, the World Trade Organization. She was chairing there, the council. Um, she's a lawyer. Um, she is. She has quite a high profile, and um, Kenyans are divided. It seems to me um, on uh, on her because she's credited with having supported um, Uhuru Kenyatta in his campaign against the International Criminal Court and got him off the hook. Uh, actually, in the end, um, there of course various factors were into play, but she was she was quite high profile in that whole ICC debate that I'll touch on later on. Um, and she's had a lot of campaigning. The Kenyan media, President uh, Uhuru Kenyatta. Um, then um, we have uh, some outs, well, a outsider, Musa Faki Mohammed, who is the foreign minister of Chad and has been for a long time. Um, he is a strong supporter of um, President Idris Debi, who is the chair of the um, African Union for 2016. There were also rumors that um, the former foreign minister of Somalia, uh, uh, um, also a woman candidate uh, for Siwa Yusuf Haji Had Adan would be a candidate, but it seemed to us that they had withdrawn. She's not on the list but in any case, we saw. Um, so Musa Faki Mama, just so that you know um, what he looks like. Um, it could be that uh, Francophones within West Africa and Central Africa are divided over uh, choosing between Abdullah Batali and, and uh, Musa Faki, who has been a long-standing face, uh, I would say, in diplomacy on the continent. Um, strong support from his president, who has a very high profile as a U chairperson. Chad has really um, imposed itself almost on the continent with all its peacekeeping in Mali and in um, against Boko Haram and so on. Um, and it could be he could be maybe a compromise in a sense that many African leaders don't want a too strong candidate for the AU chairperson elections because uh, they feel um, they don't want so they want somebody who carries out their decisions. They don't want someone who questions their decisions. Um, okay, so those are the candidates. Um, very briefly, the very contentious issues um, during these elections is, first of all, the International Criminal Court. 
um, because, as you know, the AU had been campaigning for a long time against uh, the ICC. It doesn't ask its ask member states not to respect the um, arrest warrant against uh, Omar al Bashir. We saw that crisis here in South Africa at the Santan AU summit. Al Bashir came, he then left uh, at midnight or without us all knowing. And um, so, um, sorry, uh, I've been talking too fast, apparently. Um, I'll slow down a bit. Um, so the, the um, International Criminal Court uh, issue is important here because Senegal um, has been campaigning um, against the call for withdrawal from the uh, International Criminal Court. At, in July, um, actually in January already, Kenya put forward a suggestion that all member states should withdraw from the International Criminal Court. South Africa, in a way, supported that. It was on the table again in July at the Executive Council meeting of the um, AU summit. Um, and Senegal was one of the countries who stood up and said, no, we we are all members, there's a 34 states, um, member states in Africa of the AU and so a minority is not going to dictate to us to withdraw from the uh, ICC. So, um, and as we know, Amina Mohammed from uh, Kenya um, is, is, they are campaigning against the ICC. So does that mean um, we are going to have Batili and Amina Mohammed uh, facing off about the ICC issue and um, somewhere in the middle is Vincent Moitoy from Botswana. We know Botswana is definitely a supporter of the International Criminal Court and that is one of the reasons why people say she didn't win uh, in July. But um, her campaign has not been that strong um she could be a compromise candidate she does have sadik behind her which is 15 uh, countries and um if sadik decides to continue voting for her throughout um then <coughs> who knows i mean I, I i really it's very difficult to um, make any predictions, but I could say she is an outsider as well here because of her profile and because, as I said, before July, there were calls from, uh, for example, former President Tao Bumbeki, Kofi Annan. They all wanted these elections to be postponed because they felt that um, the candidates, the profile of the candidates are not up to scratch. So. Is there going to be a change of heart? We don't know. We're already in October, December, everything sort of shuts down, at least here in Southern Africa. She hasn't been campaigning at least um, as strongly as the other candidates. So the International Criminal Court, to come back to that, Abdullah Batili, um, of course, he is supported by Maki Sal. So, uh, and uh, the Senegalese government today um, is seen as to be pro-ICC. Siddiqui Kaba, who is the Minister of Justice of uh, Senegal, is the um, head of the state parties of the um, ICC. There was also quite a big um, competition for this position. But Siddiqui Kaba, who is a former head of the International Federation for Human Rights, um, is Minister of Justice in Senegal. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, Abdullah Batili is, is a nationalist, a pan-Africanist, he's a historian. He, um, that's not to say that he will ferociously defend the ICC and um, uh, even Siddiqui Kaba feel that they, they all feel that there should be a strong African court as well with, with no impunity for um, heads of state, which is the case that we have at the moment. Um, Senegal uh, hosted the African court to try his Habre. It was seen as a big success. So um, Abdullah Batili might um, be a little bit more neutral on this ticket. And um, it is unfortunate, I think, that um, 
we've now in this evolution of the AU elections, as I say, that hasn't that we don't have that long history of it, that it's almost countries and presidents against one another. Because after all, the position of AU Commission chairperson is for all Africans, should serve the whole continent and should have strong management capacity to streamline the AU. I'll come back, I'll come to that now when I talk about the challenges. So you now have Uhuru Kenyatta and Maki Sal against one another and Ian Kama was sort of absent and Idris Debi with his candidate. It, it, it's unfortunate that um, these issues are now um, are, play such a strong role, but this is sort of where we are. Another contentious issue is the um, Morocco's wanting to rejoin the AU. Um, definitely, Senegal is uh, the one of the biggest campaigners for Morocco and for King Mohammed VI, uh, who is at the moment or will be this week in Rwanda, and Addis Ababa is stepping up his campaign. But um, SADC and South Africa um, would be keen to have Morocco join the AU, but it definitely wouldn't want the Western Sahara to be compromised or even suspended mm -hmm. from the AU, which is what Morocco wants. Um, we'll, hear, we'll find out a bit more about that um, with time and as this visit of the king you know, um, happens. So, um, the um, that issue could come to play. The Algerians definitely don't want Morocco. Algeria has said at one point it would support SADC for this next term if North Africa can have 2019 <laughs> um, because North Africa has never had a AU Commission chairperson. And then, of course, the regional and linguistic rotation is very important. Um, the Those um, AU Commission chair, uh, chairs that I noted were um, three of them from Francophone Africa, Amara Essi, Alpha Omar Konari, and Jean Ping. So we had Mkosa Zanat Lamini Zuma, um, but some might feel we need a Kenyan or someone who is from Anglophone Africa, just to balance things out. Central Africa um, ha have got two candidates and they've just had Jean Ping, so that could also count against them. Um, so just finally, um, there are huge challenges for the new chairperson. The new chairperson will come in, in a very different context in Africa, where um, at a time when there's a plan on the table for self-financing of the African Union, um, uh, countries, uh, big countries, oil producers, Angola, Nigeria, especially Algeria, have seen their budgets uh, cut due to the fall of the oil prices. China's slowdown um, have also uh, led to lower commodity prices. So um, there's a different context to, I would say, 2012 when we were Africa rising and everyone was so optimistic. Which I think um, the, Africa is still rising. I mean, if you look at the growth rates and so on, but um, in terms of the big oil producers and commodity exporters, we are in a different context now. And there's a there is more and more pressure on the AU Commission, I think, from member states and from civil society to be more streamlined, follow up on its decision making. The AU Peace and Security Council makes a lot of decisions and often they struggle to follow it through because states are, there's a backlash in terms of sovereignty and so on. We have many lingering conflicts in South Sudan, Burundi, simmering conflicts in like we have this huge challenge of uh, the DRC ahead of us as well. Mali is still a huge problem, Boko Haram terrorism. Um, there's a lot that a new AU chairperson will have on his or her plate. And um, the new AU chairperson will have to have um, represent the continent on international um, in international meetings and forums on migration, on climate change, really project a strong voice for the continent. So yes, there's a lot of suspense. Um, I think at the moment our 
the two strong candidates are Abdullah Batali and Amina Mohammed from Kenya with um, uh, Dr. Pelonome Vincent Montoy from uh, Botswana, also in a strong position because of her regional support from SADC. But um, we will have to see how the campaigns pan out, especially during Jan January, uh, leading up to the vote, um, who's supporting who, uh, South Africa, Nigeria, Ethiopia, who they will be backing already. Um, I mean, as I said, the Kenyan media says that when President Uhuru Kenyatta this last week attended the um, Maritime Summit in Loma, he got the support from Togo, from Guinea, from now how many countries. South Africa, um, President Jacob Zuma had a, meet, had a um, state visit to Kenya um, last week. And it was also said that President Jacob Zuma is supporting or had been asked to support the Kenyan candidate. That seems in, from from what we understand is South Africa would support in the first round a Sadek candidate. Because of that loyalty, Sadek supported Nkosazan Adlami Zuma um, throughout. Um, and so there will be that. And as I said earlier, Komesa is uh, much wider than Sadek. So, um, yes, um, I think it's very tricky to predict who will win. Um, but at this point, uh, um, yes, I don't know if I <laughs> if I say uh, you know one ahead of the other it might come back to haunt me. Um, but at least I think those are the strong candidates.